Hello. So thank you so much for uh, joining. Um, and uh, I was very uh, impressed and happy with the diversity of the research that's going on. I myself was uh, in the parallel session seven, so I um, can speak for what's happening there. But I didn't want to dominate the discussion. So if you have been in the other sessions, please put uh, down the talking points that you think are good to talk about. And uh, um, I guess the big question why we're here is uh, how can uh, uh, NGHT advance the understanding of fundamental physics, uh, physics of the accretion, um, and uh, um, and whatever else uh, that uh, you are working on, uh, that's why we are all here. Um, so let me maybe switch from this very cluttered list to uh, show the contents of the Google Doc so that we are on the same page. And uh, that way it might be easier to discuss. So I wanted to kick it off with uh, posing a question to the audience. Um, so uh, in the discussion earlier in the day, um, we were wondering how can the images best help us constrain the physics of accretion? And uh, Andrew Chell suggested that um, one way they can do so is with polarization. And so I was wondering in general, what do we think are the most robust ways that the images perhaps um, together with the observations at other wavelengths can best constrain the most uncertain pieces of physics um, uh, such as the microphysics, what accelerates the electrons um, and uh, um, how they propagate throughout the, uh, throughout the medium that we observe. So any thoughts on those questions? I think uh, Michael is raising his hand. Oh, please go ahead. Oh, sure. Yeah, I mean, I, I do think polarization is a really exciting avenue to think more about. And I'm curious for these new simulations that are being done, whether you tried simulating polarized images. Um, I mean, it's a very classical approach to constrain, say, particle content with circular polarization. Um, and linear polarization, I think, is extremely powerful at, um, at conveying information about sort of sub beam scales you can tell if it's in you know if there's beam depolarization that that just averages down like you know square root of the number of uh, uh, elements so so you can really tell uh, what's going on on much smaller scales than what you're seeing um, so I would I would love to uh, I, I mean it's clear there's so much progress on the simulations and on the um, on the analysis tools and it'd be nice to find Kind of the commonality in there and, and how see how far we can push them. I see Michael is raising you, uh, his hand. Go ahead, Michael, and you can you can speak up. Uh, I I know it's a remote meeting. It's hard because we don't see each other. We can't read the emotions well, um, especially if the camera is off. So if you uh, feel comfortable switching on the camera, I would love to see all of you because I haven't seen you in ages. What it feels like ages. Um, and I see some of you and uh, I'm very happy even if I see a little tiny avatar. So thank you so much for doing that. Um, hi, hi everyone. Um, so uh, yeah, please speak, uh, speak freely. Um, even if we interrupt each other, it's fine. Uh, Michael, go ahead, please. Michael Johnson, did you want to? Oh, did you hear me before? Or... Oh, okay. Okay. So, <laughs> I, sorry. I might. I might have actually. Yeah. yeah. Oh, did did you cut out? Uh, well, anyway, I, I just think both linear and circular polarization, I think, are are really important diagnostics, especially for sort of sub beam scales and and microphysics and so forth. Yeah. I see. Uh, John Stanley is raising his hand. Yeah. Uh, if we 
polarization is a really good idea, but uh, the propagation codes uh, describing how the radiation uh, at the source propagates to us has to include uh, any rotations of planes of polarization or other uh, effects on spin. Um, Mina, did you have your hand up as well? Oh, I just, I was gonna just comment that I think it'd be maybe easier to see each other and have discussion if there was not the screen share also. Oh, open. that's a good point. Sorry, good, good um, idea, perfect. Well, one, one thing that I thought was uh, really interesting that we heard about um, earlier today uh, and, and may carry through some of the discussions that we heard this, uh, this afternoon uh, was Andrew's um, talk pointing out the uh, very large difference in dynamic range that NGHT is going to have. And, and that's going to have a lot of consequences for answering these sorts of questions because uh, in, in, in Andrew's talk, he showed that that meant that we could actually get down to the... Um, foreground emission limit in the, in the central black hole, uh, the center of the black hole shadow. Um, but it also means that we'll be able to access small wispy features. We'll increasingly be able to access the very subtle uh, fluctuations uh, in, in the brightness associated with turbulence, uh, which will help ameliorate um, uh, resolution limits. Um, and we'll be able to start mapping out uh, larger scale structures and connections of the horizon scale physics to large scale structures. And, and that second one, I think, you know, goes all the way back to the first day when we heard from Elliot, this uh, simulation uh, endeavor where they go all the way from uh, the, the uh, wolf rayets that are providing the uh, gas to the accretion flow on the larger scales in the galactic center, all the way down to the horizon. And, and maybe a, a discussion question to throw out then would be, uh, and something that we constantly see brought up as a limitation is astrophysics uh, limiting our ability to understand the, the system we're studying, the system we're looking at, uh, and therefore its gravitational implications. But how does this vastly improved dynamic range uh, help us set the astrophysical boundary condition? Um, and, and will it permit us to try to remove astrophysics as a limiting factor? Well, actually, Avery, on that on that topic, just to, I, I think this is a great thing that we should discuss. But I, I also want to think about how it relates to the longer wavelength arrays, because the NGHD will probably never have more dynamic range than the VLBA at fifteen or forty three gigahertz. Um, you know, they have very good polarization purity in some cases. You know, what what's missing there, right? Because they're studying large scale stuff with all all these features. You know, is there some, is, is it the, is it the dynamics that can be improved or simultaneous multi-frequency or, um, you know, is there some way, some, some way that we can design this instrument to fill in a gap in the capabilities of the other LBI rays? Well, isn't a big part of the gap that we get all the way down to the horizon? But, but you, you, you make a really, really good point that there's a, a sort of a missing stair, right? A missing step on, in the staircase uh, that gets filled in with NGHT because now we can, we'll, we'll have a significant overlap in radius with VLBA, right? Uh, so, so we'll be able to, um, we could imagine uh, connecting from, from micro arc second scales all the way up to arc second scales in a continuous fashion and not have any gaps in between. And you know th that, that's got to be extraordinarily powerful. So yeah, Sasha, I fully agree. You're going to have to do a lot of big simulations. <laughs> connecting, connecting the black hole scale image uh, that doesn't have a jet to the image that has a jet is is, is super useful because I guess the, the, it would break a lot of degeneracies. Uh, so right now, um, when you make an image, we still don't understand uh, is the ring coming from the accretion disk or from the jet. Uh, and now if we actually see the base of the jet, then I feel like that will constrain basically the relative normalization, it's speaking, speaking in the most simplest terms. Of course, this relative normalization comes from very complex input in for the 
electron thermodynamics. Uh, but uh, uh, but at least it will give us a data point to match uh, that is currently absent. Well, let, let me let me throw out a um, kind of a crazy idea. Um, imagine that it's so so a lot of these extended. I mean, this this large scale simulation that that uh, Elliot described that goes out to Wolf Ray is is observationally informed at the outer boundary, right? He's setting his outer boundary conditions by some measured you know, measured input. If we could, if we could see um, something like Sagittarius star M87 out to a hundred gravitational radii, uh, would that give us enough information that we could just hand off that boundary condition to someone like you, Sasha, and say, simulate how things have to be inside. And then um, maybe we don't get the exact representation of what we see, but, but we'll have a a, an approximate representation that's now tied to those outer boundary conditions in a fundamental way. And that starts to remove the astrophysical, uh, astrophysical uncertainties. And we could even- we So could that even would be amazing. If you, could give, if you could give me the boundary conditions, Avery, uh, that would be awesome. You solve everything. The only problem is that boundary conditions is not like a set of three numbers or four numbers or even 10 numbers. Uh, it's, uh, it's a two-dimensional distribution. Uh, right over a sphere of a bunch of uh, parameters uh, like uh, magnetic field, for instance. What is the geometry? What is the strength? Um, and what is its spectrum? So there will be always a lot of information that's hiding from us. Uh, um, so uh, this is, uh, and also like, even if you tell me you're giving me boundary conditions, but NGHT will not give us the boundary conditions. It will give us the image or a series of images at different wavelengths. And so it is on us uh, to figure out how to map those images into the boundary conditions, right? And uh, this brings us back to the challenge of uh, what shines and, and how it shines. You know, the electrons shine, we don't know how they heat it. So I'm wondering, um, apart from uh, the polarization, which I feel like it's, it's something that uh, is an additional tiebreaker. Is there something else that we can extract from the images? I imagine time variability might be helpful. Um, I imagine spatial, um, spatial variations, not just the time variability of the overall light curve could also be helpful. Seeing actual blobs moving around, I feel like that would be, um, would be providing us quite a bit of uh, constraints on what is actually shining because right now we still don't know uh, what are those uh, gravity uh, blobs that are moving around. So if we could actually uh, see the images on the horizon scales, that would be a really nice thing. So I'm trying to kind of brainstorm what sort of things can we get um, from the observations and not only on the astrophysics because I'm coming from that side. So uh, please feel free up please feel free to speak up from session nine, where we have a really nice summary here. Um, and the first question is, can we probe dark matter? Like, I have no idea. Can we probe dark matter uh, with NGHT? Uh, and how can we do that? If I may chime in on a more uh, realistic situation. So I think there was a paper by, I think, Elliot and collaborators in which it said that if the accretion disk is misaligned with the black hole spin, you can have boundary conditions that violate axisymmetry. Right, now stationary and axisymmetry is a geometric feature of curved black holes. Now, you said that we can observe shorter time scales. Now on the longer time scales, they'll average out and the curved black hole maintains the axisymmetry. But if you're going to shorter time scales, if you're able to even for a moment observe a violation of axisymmetry, that I think is a big deal in and of itself because those are two defining features of the curved geometry. So if that is possible to observe by any astrophysical situation, that's basically a test of GR. So well, I speak. think it's, but it's not the space time that's not axisymmetric. symmetric. It's the, it's the plasma in that space time because there's something else misoriented relative to the black hole spin. So I don't, I think- I mean, if you had an EMRI, so not a GR then yes, it would be non axis symmetric. So I think that making the questions one is trying to test as precise as possible. So for instance, can we test whether or not there are uh, large scale coherent magnetic fields that are coherent on scales comparable to or larger than the horizon? So 
sort of the defining feature of the MAD simulations. And it seems to me there that what Michael said, basically spatially resolved polarization information along with the images is really a, a, key, a key way of going at that. Um, you know, there's a lot of work on other astrophysical sources where we have spatially resolved synchrotron emission, um, multi-wavelength data, Faraday rotation, linear polarization, specifically galaxies um, and, and radio lobes of AGN, but galaxies in some ways even better because there's a lot of nearby examples. Um, and the, the degeneracy there that's challenging, I think is the same one that we struggle with a bit here. It's the degeneracy of what the electrons are doing versus what the magnetic field is doing and trying to figure out how to break that degeneracy. And I think the best bet is absolutely the Faraday rotation, intrinsic polarization angles, circular, you know, maybe the circular polarization as well. Can, can, can I ask um, Chad? maybe a, 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 a related question? And this is one I, I typically ask of Charles Gammy. I'm not sure if he's here and, and I torture him with it. Um, but but the, the question is, imagine Sasha made a simulation and he knew what all the parameters were, the black hole mass, the black hole spin, the microphysics, the magnetic field, the boundary conditions. And then he showed it to somebody else, uh, Elliot or Avery, and, and ray traced it through to, to, for two frequencies, let's say 230 and 345, and, and gave you everything. Like you had everything, but you didn't know what all the inputs were. What could you tell about that system? In other words, if you had everything, what could you deduce from something if it was made by somebody else? Because we're, we're asking, and Michael's asking the right question, dude, what if we filled in this scale between the black hole and the jet? And what if we had spatial resolution and time resolution? But what if we had everything? Is there just, are there just some degeneracies in the problem that are hard to solve? Everything do you mean, including the plasma data or just the provisional observational stuff like images and LCDs? Just the observational stuff. Just if, if you had like a totally filled UV plane and, and you could make a movie of what you saw as a two-dimensional projection of what was happening in that space time, what could you do? Well, if you have infinite resolution, uh, then I think that it will immediately tell us a lot of things just by looking by eye. Like if you showed me that, I would be like, is we, we were basically exploring this exact thing. Of, of course, we weren't looking at the radiation, radiation transfer yet, although um, I think there are some images, but like we ran this really high resolution, you know, a few thousand cubes global simulation. And uh, it's just fascinating what you can see. You know, you start seeing this little uh, small scale plasmoids that, that shine and move around. So uh, I guess I think that when you actually can make a movie with the details that shows you not just the, you know, one ring, but structure moving on it, then, um, um, you know, you start, you know, dissecting it and asking what it can be. So I guess what we want is we want some sort of uh, handle how to grab the physics that we, we currently uh, have like uh, have no constraints on, um, and uh, so I think time dependence is definitely something that would be super useful to see in the simulation. That's exactly what we did when we started looking at the simulations. We didn't even get to the polarization or anything like this, uh, just looking at the images itself. Um, but Shep, are you asking? Is there a formal inversion process by which one could go from the observational data? to a set of underlying physical properties of the system. That's what Shep wants, yes. Yeah. I don't know if there is such a thing. Yeah. I don't know if there is either. I... If Shep, if he wants to know what's gonna kill you, I think the lack of opacity will kill you because you will look through optically thin regions and they will be projected onto each other. And all that structure along the line of sight is already degenerate, degenerate for you. That's for that's what yeah. we do. Yeah, right. yeah. I mean, well, there, there, there is that projection problem. Uh, but, yeah, but, but, but you solve oh, that with time, right? You solve I, in part I actually like it. I yeah. like if everything is a good thing because you can see everything. Nothing is hiding from me because that's why we want to go to high frequencies, of course, uh, also to get better resolution. 
but I mm-hmm. would take in a heartbeat uh, something that's optically thin uh, than something that is optically thick because there's no chance for you to extract the data from an optically thick image. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I mean, in, I, 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 I think we, that... we, we, we study projections all the time, right? Every baseline sees a projection. Um, I, I think one, one thing to come out of the feature extraction or the, um, the science extraction section is we're, and, and also the talks this morning, Andrew's talk and other is, I think we're getting much better at locking onto the black hole parameters in a model agnostic way. Um, I mean, we've come a long way in a few years and we're gonna come much further by the time the MGGHT is, is launched and, and confidently pinning down you know, the space time in, in some agnostic way was a huge mm-hmm. way in limiting it. You know, then you're just studying the, the plasma physics and, and, um, and I think that there are, you know, if you go to large scales and it's fairly uniform and it's high, high fractional polarization, uh, then you can really talk about basically you know, direct measurements of magnetic field structure. Then you add spectral index mm-hmm. and Faraday rotation um, and, and you just have enough degrees of freedom at every point to, uh, to piece together a full three-dimensional geometry. I mean, I think, I think it's actually looking more and more hopeful. Uh, but, well, yeah, go yeah, okay. Well, well I, I just want to throw one, one a different way of, 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 of phrasing this question. Um, you know, this gets back to, to Elliot's point. You, you could think about feeding a neural net or antagonistic neural networks, everything, and having them do the dirty work of trying to figure out what all the patterns were and how to relate all the inputs into something that you wanted to define. And you could train it with a zillion different simulations and it would come up with some way of doing it. And there's already been some work by people in the EHT and of course elsewhere on this. Um, but what, what I'm not asking for a perfectly invertible problem, but I'm just asking for the handles. I'm asking you, what are the, what are the key observables to give us the most traction on what we want? Because that will help us define the instrument. So you know, do we want 15 dishes that are six meters because UV coverage is absolutely critical because we need to get low surface brightness sensitivity? Or do we want count fewer dishes, but they have to be 10 meters because the point source sensitivity is dominant in, in, in the optimization? So the, these are the kind of things that we need to be able to, 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 to design around. And the problem is so complex that sometimes I get worried I'm still optimistic, but I, I get worried that this process of defining the instrument could be open-ended. But I think you bring in a really good point. So um, maybe we should just do that experiment. You know, team number one runs a simulation. Team number two tries to tries to figure out what that is. Um, and uh, um, what we want is the uh, and. You know, I think Koshik already showed some of the uh, preview images of NGHT for different simulations. Like we can just try and see what do we care about? What is the most important aspect? Uh, uh, is it the dynamic range or is it, uh, is it something else that we particularly care about uh, in the image? What gives you the most uh, information? Um, I think that's a hard question to answer because, you know, off the top of my head, I can think of two different ways you could approach answering that question. One would be from the gravity perspective um, or from the measuring spin perspective. And so if you had an infinite resolution measurement, an infinite resolution image or, or movie, I think that there's a good argument that you could make a measurement of spin and inclination uh, completely for the black hole. And, you know, there are caveats, obviously. Um, and then alternatively, if you're interested in, you know, understanding what you know, whether the flow is mad or sane, for example, you would be really interested in tracking the bulk. Work. I would be really interested in, for example, tracking the bulk features and what they look like in polarization. Um, and I think that the, the arrays that answer those two questions look very different. Um, and, and certainly they're not, you know, they're not mutually exclusive, but I, I think that it's, I think you have to answer that broader question first. So I think that's what Shep wants. He wants an executive summary of, uh, you know, I put a million dollars here or there, and then this is what I gain or this is what I lose. Right. So, 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 uh, I mean, th- these conversations have been ongoing. Um, it, it, it's a it's a nice question to ask, but it really does depend upon what you're looking for. Um, if if we knew what the right model for 
M87, SAGE star, whatever other system we're going to target was. Uh, th then there's a very clear answer. We can, we can build a, an optimal estimator to pull out whatever parameters we think are critical for that model, and then and then just look for um, you know as much SNR as we can on on extracting those. But if we don't know what we're looking for, um, then that creates a very different optimization problem. And so. Um, and, and you know we have numerous examples of this in our in our daily life. You know if you if you want to know where you are, you you might take a photo of a room. Uh, if all you want to know was the distance between you and the wall, then a then a laser rangefinder will work just fine with a spot, and you don't care about everything else in the room. And so the same thing's true for the NGHT. Um, if we if we know exactly what we're looking for, that that's gonna that's gonna require one design. And if if we don't that's going to require a different design. design. And, and so these questions require balances. Coming up with the right sets of challenges and developing uh, candidate analyses to test them, I think is critical to, to the kind of solution you proposed, Sasha. And, that, and that's part of uh, hopefully what we will, we will motivate people to start doing as part of this conference is um, building out concrete analyses that we can run simulated data sets through and get answers to if, if we gave you this kind of data, how well could you measure this thing you care about? Uh, yesterday, today and yesterday, we heard several calls for better time resolution. And I assume that better time resolution usually means more antennas. So quantitatively, what time resolution do we want? Well, determined by such a star properties, probably. Because for oh, you, 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 it's you, lower. Hmm. May I, I Hello? Uh, uh, yeah, go ahead, Linda. Uh, yeah, okay, thanks. Um, I think uh, Shep raises very important question, practically important, and uh, I, for one, would love to have uh, ability to give an answer, objective answer. However, I'm afraid uh, it is simply impossible. Uh, it's incorrectly formulated, mathematically incorrectly formulated question. So this is, uh, let's say, pessimistic uh, view on that. However, there is a reason to be optimistic as well, because in my opinion is, uh, that if you open up uh, new significant parameter space, and in the example given by Shep, it might be either UV coverage, which would allow to address uh, low brightness features in the image, or concentrate on uh, compact features with high sensitivity. Well, fine. The point is that you will most likely if you open up significant new parameter space, most likely you will find something which you do not expect. And this might be the most interesting thing, which is not predictable. Because after all, if all our efforts are simply to confirm in a better way what we already know, okay, that's fine. But this is not really exciting thing. And in radio astronomy, it happened many times with all major facilities that they have been built for something which in the end turned to be, well, yeah, okay, done, thank you. But the most exciting thing was not predicted. I think that NGEHT does have a potential of this thing. Therefore, surely we must come up with a, a very solid, um, proposal to say that we will do that, we will confirm this model, we will confirm that model, we will be able to, uh, to improve knowledge of uh, or estimate of mass of Sagittarius, etc. Fine. Yeah, it should be said with as solid voice as possible. However, most important thing is not predictable. Uh, just do your best to open up new parameter space. That's it. And this is how we're going to sell it to the NSF. Um, 
Well, on that wonderful note, I think uh, our time is up for this discussion. Um, it has been a great pleasure and a lot of fun to see you all and uh, and uh, hear hear everyone's thoughts. And uh, I guess, uh, do the organizers, the LOC, have anything that they wanted to announce? I don't know if the LOC does, but perhaps uh, every Avery or Michael or Shep has something to say about tomorrow more specifically. I think yeah. uh, we still need people on the sign-up sheet. But tomorrow, you know, it's great to have these brainstorming sessions and talk about, you know, ideas and vague generalities. Tomorrow, we're going to be putting down on sheets, this is what we want to do, this is how you're going to measure it, this is why it's important and how important it is. So, you know, tomorrow is when we formulate the, the ideas that will drive the design of this array. Um, so sign up, participate, it's going to be fun. You know, there's, there's no easy answers here. Um, but I think uh, tomorrow is when it all comes together, and we get to see uh, we get to see where we stand after hearing all these all these great ideas all week. So, so sign up. how does it work, I, Michael? Oh, sorry, go ahead, oh, Shep. Is it Shep. Well, I, I want to add one thing that uh, something that Michael I think is going to talk about tomorrow is that we, we plan on having what we call analysis challenges. I think we've mentioned this before. What made the EHT really work very very well is that we had imaging challenges. We didn't quite know what kind of data we were going to get, but we interrogated all the new algorithms that were developed with synthetic data to perfect them and refine them. In the same way, now we can think about doing this for the NGHT, but giving people analysis challenges. So we plan on making synthetic data from one of these simulations, giving it to people, and then asking everyone, solve for the thing that you are most interested in. If it's GR, then solve for deviations from GR. If it's uh, if it's spin, then solve for spin, and we'll be able to have all the answers. And uh, and then through this iterative process, we'll refine our algorithms. So when, when you think tomorrow about all the questions that you have, think about how to test them as well. That's all I wanted to add. So, so the breakout rooms are pretty small, six people. So how are we going to put it all together um, into a coherent message? Yeah. Do we have a plan I, for that? I can give you just a, a quick preview of that. Um, so, so basically each room, you know, you're going to be talking in a small group, you're going to see everyone's face hopefully and, and uh, get to know each other. And, and each group is going to fill out a, a little spreadsheet um, where you're going to list science goals, observation needed, you're going to rank the importance of it, and you're going to rank the feasibility. Um, but there are different groups that are, uh, there, are, there are multiple fundamental physics groups. So in, in the first session, your group of five or, or six is going to do this. In the second session, you're going to come together with all the other fundamental physics groups, and you're going to see what everyone put, and you're going to try to converge on um, a consensus set of science goals and, and importance ranked um, uh, for each theme. So we have two uh, we have two, two organizers for each of these, and um, and they'll try to to guide this towards a, a conclusion. Then in the afternoon, each of the teams is going to come out come back and they'll, they'll present in a plenary session up to five slides saying, here's what we think the high, high level goals uh, should be after all our discussions, here's why, here's what's needed. Um, so, so the idea is that we're gonna, through the day, try to march towards this con uh, consensus view uh, with, with really you know, important science drivers identified by each theme. Um, and so we'll close out the week with you know, a clear view of what this array has to, uh, has to be able to deliver to be a success. Sounds great. Um, well, if there are no more announcements, I guess that we can officially close this uh, discussion. Thanks everyone so much. Thanks, Asher. Thank, Thank you, you very much, Mike. Thanks, bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.